What an astonishing thing a book is. It is a flat object made from a tree, with flexible parts on which are imprinted lots of funny dark squiggles. But one glance at it, and you're inside the mind of another person. Maybe somebody dead for thousands of years. Across the millennia, an author is speaking clearly and silently inside your head, directly to you. Writing is perhaps the greatest of human inventions, binding together people who never knew each other, citizens of distant epochs. Books break the shackles of time. A book is proof that humans are capable of working magic. Carl Sagan. Words from a man of science and words from an absolute legend. Growing up can often mean leaving behind our childlike innocence and wonder, only to face a world that is so unpredictable and yet written by us. But those aspects or stories of ourselves that once made us children are not gone. They remain hidden, buried in the depths of our minds, as we continue to adapt to the realities we have both created and the ones that have been imposed upon us. Really just another role-playing game. As we delve deeper into the characters and themes of the show From and the season 2 finale, it's important to note that there is still much unknown context and information. Our observations and interpretations may be prone to distortion, as we piece together the narrative based on the information we currently have. As the show evolves, our understanding of these themes and character relationships may change and develop as well. With that in mind, let's dive into this analysis. We are back to expand on a very important theme in the show From. Be warned to spoilers ahead. And thank you AMGN for the press access. In previous videos, we explored how the boy in white, along with Ethan and Victor, can serve as representations of the psychological concept of the inner child in different ways, with Victor representing the eternal child who does not grow up and remains psychologically stuck. It is also evident that there is predominantly childlike imagery in the show, just like Victor's drawings, which are central to it. In fact, the very theme song of the show, Casera Sera, was originally performed by the American actress and singer Doris Day, and first debuted in the iconic 1956 film by Alfred Hitchcock titled The Man Who Knew Too Much, where two parents have to rescue their child from kidnappers. In the movie, the song is ultimately used as a means of rescuing their child. <laughs> What will be, will be. And this song just so happens to beautifully and nostalgically not only capture the uncertain nature of life and existence, but also the different stages and cycle of human growth, from childhood to parenthood and so on, which we've seen the show systematically illustrate. Throughout history, the symbol of the child has represented purity and innocence. It is in the Bible Jesus famously said that unless we become like little children and humbled like them, we will never enter the kingdom of heaven. We can see the emphasis on humility and the openness of children to learn new things without over-relying on their own reasoning. And we know this through research as well, that children are indeed more malleable and exploratory even when they weigh the same risks as adults before making a decision. Their brains are more plastic, meaning they can more readily adapt to new ways of looking at the world. This is something we begin to lose the older we get almost like drying cement on a block of pavement. Our brains and behavioral patterns become more rigid and more resistant to significant deviations from what we think reality is, our beliefs, even though there are ways to help mitigate and slow this down. Surely another subject for another time. In the show From, these concepts are captured by the presentation of Boyd's wife, nicknamed Iron Abbey, who was unable to bend, to cope with and adapt to the reality of the town. And to varying degrees, we can see these ideas embodied by different characters like Jim or Jade, who historically have been very sad and even arrogant in their own beliefs. But how do all these tie into the storyline of the show? Before covering the new, let's start with someone we already know. According to Carl Jung, one of the universal archetypes or symbols that guide humans is that of the divine child, which can be seen represented across different religions and cultures as we've covered before. In the psychological context, the divine child symbol is neither good nor evil. The divine child acts as a guide and manifests during the most difficult situations, sometimes in the form of dreams, 
to facilitate the process of individuation or self-realization of the mind, where one becomes integrated with the hidden aspects of our unconscious mind, or our forest of the unconscious. In therapeutic practice, the concept of the inner child is often used to help people heal from trauma. The idea of rescuing our inner children as a stepping stone towards psychological healing and self-realization is also tied to Jung's concept of the marriage of opposites. The sun and the moon, light and darkness, conscious and unconscious, the above and the below, the verbal and the non-verbal. In psychological therapy, one of the usual goals of trauma treatment is to guide people in contextualizing the source or manifestations of the trauma, even the components of the trauma that can't be expressed by words, the marriage of the unconscious and the conscious. Before we move on, let's define trauma. While trauma can manifest in many different forms and impact people in different ways, as a general definition, trauma occurs when a specific event or repeated exposure to some severe events like violence, death, and abuse overwhelm an individual's defense mechanisms and ability to cope with and process such experiences in a coherent manner. One metaphor that can capture a manifestation of trauma is a shattered mirror. When trauma occurs, it can be as though a mirror reflecting the person's experience shatters into countless pieces. Each piece represents a fragmented memory or sensory imprint that is disconnected from the whole, much like scenes from a movie appearing out of sequence. Reassembling the shards of the mirror in trauma therapy is one of the ways of helping the individual reprocess, reintegrate, and make sense of these disjointed memories to create a whole and coherent narrative of the dramatic experience. Noting all of these observations and the emphasis on psychic phenomena and dreams we've seen on season two, it seems more fair to consider how the show might be an allegory for the process of healing and psychological self-realization. In this case of a mind that is not integrated, but is fragmented, shattered, and struggling to become whole. We can find a parallel to this all the way back in episode 2 of season 1, where Kenny's father tells the nurse that a scary nightmare is when the mind doesn't work, making reference to his dementia. When, when this when, when this no work, that's, that's nightmare. Even more interesting, in that same episode, we see Sarah talk about the story of a girl in a room full of broken glass. The girl knows the pieces belong together, but all she can see are the shards. As she tries to put them back together, she starts bleeding, but just keeps going, because the girl knows that these pieces used to mean something and that there is an answer. And she bleeds all over the floor. But she keeps on trying. Sarah then compares the voices she hears to these shards of glass. Also, this depiction of digging at the broken pieces of glass, even though they lacerate and hurt, make you bleed, is a proper and visceral illustration of how trauma can work and manifest. In trauma, sometimes it is difficult to see the forest for the trees, or the big picture. Just like the girl can only see the shards, but the bigger picture is the object they used to make up. This is yet more meaningful, noting that Forest for the Trees was the title of episode 8 of season 2, and also echoes what Kenny said in the season 2 finale about each of them being only a single thread in a larger tapestry or sweater. You know, my dad used to say, it's hard to see the sweater when you're only just a thread. The thread is unable to perceive the bigger system it is part of, and everything is a system. It is also interesting how Season 2, Episode 5, parallels Sarah's story of the broken glass a little bit. When Sarah tries to pick up the broken pieces from her ceramic snowman, which we could also view as Sarah trying to hold on to or save an aspect of her childhood, since she mentioned in that same episode that she and her brother Nathan will collect these Christmas ornaments when they were children. But there is a missing part of the story that she didn't elaborate on. We don't know about their parents or caregivers, or what happened to them, or what specifically the ornaments reminded them of. Nathan kept one with him all these years. He said it reminded him of a time when things were... Asara didn't get to finish her sentence. It's a little ironic that we, the audience, are equally dealing with broken or fragmented pieces of the overall story. And it seems like some people might actually be feeling the pain of trying to put the broken shards together. What we do know, however, 
if we go back to episode five, season one, is that Nathan rescued Sarah from a bad situation and that it was only the two of them from that point on, according to Sarah. It is only implied that Sarah didn't like being with the man she was living with, as she said she's glad that that man is no longer around. He wasn't. It's better that he's not around anymore. But we don't know the full context here. In the words of Jim, Something here is missing. We just can't see it yet. But we will. We can also look back at Jade's words in season one, episode 10, where he mentions that he grew up in France with his grandmother. Jay then explains that his grandmother passed away when he was just 12 years old, and then he had to go back to the US to live with his uncle. He's very specific about how he had to fly back to the US on his own because there was no one. I had to, uh, I had to ride on the plane by myself because there was, um, there was no one to, you know. But fails to finish that sentence. He does express, however, that he didn't want to leave France, but his grandmother had no other family who lived there. He explains how he was crying at the airport and didn't want to leave his grandmother alone, even though she was dead. It is then he says that a nice lady at the airport bought him a soda and told them, they come with you when you go, possibly as a way to console Jade on his trip back to the US, assuring him that in a way, his grandmother will always be a part of him. This is a likely interpretation, noting how Jade used the same words to make Tian Chen feel better about leaving the town while she was still mourning the death of her husband. However, it is still interesting to note how in episode 9 of season 2, Sarah highlighted to Kenny how Tian Chen once told her how grateful she was that they were all together when they got trapped in the town. She couldn't finish that sentence, but we can infer that that was the intended message. And I think this may somehow be connected to Jade's quote, they come with you when you go, and the yearning for interconnectedness that it represents. Now, we have a lot to unpack right here, and I really have to give huge props to the writers of the show for packing so much character substance in such a concise format. First, we see that Jade went through a pretty traumatic experience as a child. He was only 12 when his grandmother passed away. The writers also let us know that he grew up with his grandmother as his primary caregiver. And we are left to wonder about Jade's parents. What happened to them? We also don't know what it was like for Jade to continue growing up with his uncle in the US, though his body language and words, Live with my uncle. the fact that his uncle let a child travel on his own while grieving, suggests that Jay did not have any other real support system besides his grandmother. And these items here have different sublayers. This situation ties back to the psychological theory of attachment styles, which explains that the relationships and bonds we form with our caregivers from infancy through childhood profoundly influence our emotional development. Even early experiences like body language cues and physical interactions babies sense from their caregivers have a significant impact on how we approach relationships and interact with others as adults. There's even research that suggests that trauma can be unintentionally passed from caregivers to infants this way. In the case of Jade and what we know about his past history and his current behavior suggests that he may have developed an avoidant dismissive attachment style, which is characterized by avoidance and dismissiveness of emotional and close relationships with others. People like this can even come across arrogant. So that means one of us built a multi-million dollar software company and the other does what, safety tests on the teacup, right? Overconfident, indifferent, and tend to have poor emotional self-regulation. But the indifferent front they show is really a facade. Wait, no, no, look. Hey, what? I'm sorry, okay? A mask they use to cover their fear of being vulnerable. Avoidant dismissive attachment styles can develop when caregivers are unavailable or inconsistently available. We could say in the case of Jade's parents and his uncle. Also, when a child is left to their own devices, like Jade having to fly back to the US on his own, or when caregivers are lost. In the case of Jade losing his grandmother, the one caregiver that he seemed to have a strong bond or attachment with, judging by how he didn't want to leave her behind even though she had passed away. Notice how Jade uses the words, I didn't want to leave her alone, referring to his dead grandmother, which echoes Jade's own feelings of abandonment and loneliness. This behavior is consistent in season two when he interacts with Tabitha. Physically impossible for you not to be 
assholes for longer than 10 minutes? Great, you're yelling at me again. That didn't take very long. Another characteristic of the avoidant dismissive types is high self-reliance or self-sufficiency, which makes sense given how this style is formed partly due to a lack of or an absence of support from caregivers at an early age. And we see this in how Jade avoids working with others. He likes to work alone and solve problems by himself, invested in his own ideas. He also becomes highly frustrated and agitated when he needs something from somebody but has any difficulty in getting that. People like this also tend to avoid other people influencing their plans, which we saw in how Jay rapidly lost interest in the radio, pivoting to the symbol as soon as Jim became invested in that project. Look, if you would just take a look at the symbol, open the book. What is wrong with you? We have a legitimate chance here to go home and you're... Additionally, it is not uncommon for people with this attachment style to overachieve and seek validation in certain areas of their lives, judging by Jade's career achievements, as a way to compensate for the emotional void he felt as a child. We could also try to make sense of Jade's constant yelling at people by paralleling the crying of an infant who demands their caregiver's attention, connecting back to the genesis of this attachment style and Jade's lack of emotional support growing up. Interestingly, however, we can see that Jade seems to have a much calmer demeanor with both Tabitha and Tian Chan. And this partly makes sense within the context we've been exploring. Both Tian Chan and Tabitha serve as mother figures. In the case of Tabitha, we can also see this influence in her effective interactions with Victor, who might see a reflection of the mother he lost, Miranda, in Tabitha, just like Jade might see a reflection of the grandmother he lost in Tian Chan. Both Tabitha and Tian Chan exude the nurturing aspect of the mother figure archetype, and it's also fascinating to look at this peculiar bond that is evolving between Tian Chan and Jade. Particularly in episode 10 of season 1, it is interesting to see Jade's body language become much less defensive and vulnerable when speaking with Tian Chan, almost like that of a child or his 12-year-old self. I have to give props to the actor who plays Jade, as he seems to perfectly capture the essence of his character. Jade quickly became close to my favorite character as soon as he showed up in the town. I also remember how in my first video about the series, I noted how parental bonds appeared to be a salient theme just within the first three episodes of the show, and I can now see how this theme is evolving into a much deeper context in season two. More about that later. The other missing piece of context from Jade's background is the mention of a lady at the airport who bought him a soda and told him, they come with you when you go. The writers made the effort to attach this reference to a new and mysterious character that consoles Jade as he's going back to the US. Judging by how deliberate the dialogue in From seems to be, I wouldn't be surprised if the writers reveal more relevant context related to that unknown character in future seasons. Death also fits the DSM clinical criteria for a traumatic event. These experiences or events become part of who we are, embedded in our very biology. They come with us, sometimes without us being consciously aware that they are the source of problematic psychological or emotional symptoms. Nearly all of the characters in the show have been exposed to traumatic events in the clinical sense. Going deeper into the narrative of the show as it relates to the theme of trauma, we have also seen allusions to different timelines or generations of the town's residents, and it is being suggested in the storyline that these different generations of people have some kind of relationship to each other that has not yet been revealed in the show. We were also presented with the dates Tabitha saw inside the lighthouse and Boyd and Sarah saw inside the bottles back in season one, with the most notorious date being 1864, referencing the American Civil War, which has also been referenced repeatedly throughout the show in several forms. We also have some evidence suggesting that some of the other dates also reference events that are historically loaded with significant violence or suffering. However, the most direct reference we have for these are Boyd, Sarah's, and even Abby's own words, expressing that it seems like the town fits some pain or suffering. 
Yet, a better example connecting to the theme of trauma is how Boyd connected the fact that two of the newcomers who died in season 2, Brian and Kelly, reminded him of the first time he saw someone die while touring in Iraq. We can see how Boyd's observation of the newcomers' names served as a trigger for his traumatic memory. First time I ever watched someone die. Corporal Brian Kelly. How about that? The famous psychologist Sigmund Freud once presented this underrated yet interesting concept of something he referred to as screen memories. Freud believed that given how memories of traumatic events are often repressed or fragmented in our unconscious minds, our minds sometimes invent a fake screen or creative memory that weaves those fragments into what seems like a coherent narrative and one that is easier to process. These screen memories were meant to be a coping mechanism for trauma. With that in mind, as for the unique mythology that engulfs the series, we can interpret it as a collective coping device for this process of healing or coping and subsequent self-realization of the characters. Whether the technical answer to the plot is simulation, alien, supernatural, sci-fi, or all or none of the above, the psychological themes can remain central to the show, one of several layers, just like this is only one of the various psychological themes that can be drawn from the show. Besides this, everything else is just... Looks like I had a connection problem there, but I gotta go to the next section, on the creators of the show. A creator's work can also offer a window into the creator's own psychology and mental contents. Creative work often just serves as a vessel for the transport and transmission of themes and intentions that are relevant to the creator, even if the creator is not consciously aware of this. And this also applies to people creating content about the show, like me and others. As a fan of the series, I'd like to give an enormous shout out to John Griffin, Jack Bender, Jeff Pinkner, and everyone else involved both behind and in front of the scenes to create this amazing show. I would like to also share some words that executive producer Jeff Minkner said about the show in an Epic's panel interview. He said, every book my mom read, she would go to the end of the book first and read the last page. She hated suspense and hated not knowing what the ending was going to be, and it drove me insane. If we told you all the answers, you would be like, okay, but watching the journey and how these answers affect the characters that's where the value of the story comes from. The journey is a reward. Pinkner also said, I think as John said, the mythology is central to the show, of course. But really, I think, like all great genre, we were looking for an opportunity to tell a story about people. Everything else is really just designed to be either pressure points or a goal. Either the thing you're afraid of or the thing you're hoping for. And the story takes place between those two poles. They also assured us in that interview that the series is fully mapped out and that the deployment of elements and answers is very deliberate. I've also grown to really appreciate Jack Bender's art, who is executive producer for the show and who is behind the fascinating art we see throughout the show. Bender seems to have a peculiarly fascinating talent for infusing his paintings and drawings with very deep psychological and emotional themes. He's also releasing a book in September of this year titled I am sorry, art and apologies, which is set to touch on elements of humanity and healing through his art. If you like the art and illustrations in the show, I invite you to take a look at his book. I left the link in the description of this video and in the comment section. Alrighty, if you thought we reached the end, fear not, for we are just getting started. Hey, what's up, Frumland fans? It's Nocturnal Critic. Yeah, I know, some of you are thinking, why the hell are we hearing your voice right now? Well, if any of you guys also watch my content, then you might remember that I made some connections between episode 8 of From and A Nightmare on Elm Street during my episode 8 recap. Very jokingly, of course. But Mr. Fromland is going to do what he does best and do a deep dive analysis into all of that stuff. So please take it away, sir, and thanks for having me. Nah, thank you, man, for being here. Like my friend Nocturnal Critic said, I noticed some additional parallels that may suggest that some of the elements of episode 8, season 2, might be paying homage to the original 1984 film by the legendary Wes Craven, A Nightmare on Elm Street. 
Here are some of those parallels. In episode A, season 2 of Fron, we saw Kenny being burned by a cicada that jumps out of a steaming boiling pot in his dream. In the original Kruger movie, we see the main character, Nancy, similarly being burned by a boiler room steam pipe in one of her nightmares. You can even see the similarity of the burns, which are near identical. The second classic scene from that original Kruger movie is that of the bathtub, where Freddy Krueger's hand pulls down Nancy in an attempt to drown her in her sleep. And this might have paralleled the scene we saw with Elgin in the bathtub. Additionally, in From, we have the significance of the cicadas emerging from Smiley's body in the boiler room. Be warned of spoilers ahead regarding the Freddy Krueger movies. In the movies, Freddy Krueger was originally presented as a child murderer, responsible for the death of 20 children, when he was still alive. However, due to mistakes in the court proceedings, he was able to escape justice and was set free. Frustrated by this, some of the parents in the community came together and found Kruger hiding in an abandoned boiler room. They then decide to take justice into their own hands and burn Kruger alive in that boiler room. And it is there that Freddy Kruger, as a supernatural nightmare, is born. Just like in a way we see the cicadas also emerge in a boiler room for the first time. And the similarities don't stop there. We're about to delve deeper into this nightmare. After the season 2 finale of From, I'm sure some of you may have noticed some similarities between the entity that trapped the minds of Julie, Randall, and Marielle, and the character from Stranger Things, Vecna. But the thing these two have in common, really, is that we know the creators of Stranger Things, the Duffer brothers, explained that Vecna was also inspired by and a homage to the character of Freddy Krueger. They even had the original actor that played Freddy Krueger, Robert Englund, play Vecna's father. There are also many parallels we can draw between Stranger Things and From in the context of Dungeons and Dragons and Lovecraftian literature, given that they may have similar sources of inspiration and similar intentions that are more universal. But before we get too deep into those weeds, let's circle back to the main thematic focus of this comparison trauma and morally conflicting choices. The same way Stranger Things extended some of the themes we saw in the Kruger movies, primarily that of trauma, I think there's some evidence that From might be expanding these themes into a much more nuanced and deeper level, that is, the intergenerational transmission of trauma. You see, as we've been discussing, trauma is like a virus with many different vectors of transmission, biological or genetic, psychological and social, biopsychosocial. A deeper meaning that can be easily missed in the original Freddy Krueger movies is that it reflects the intergenerational ramifications of traumatic experiences, especially those that result from morally conflicting or questionable choices. Freddy Krueger essentially embodies the boogeyman archetype, which is used to remind children of the importance of behaving appropriately. It is fascinating how Freddy Krueger as a nightmare or demon is essentially born out of a morally questionable action that the community parents took. That action or decision then comes back to haunt their children later on. We can understand how it must have been frustrating for the parents to see Krueger escape justice. And the feeling of wanting to take justice into their own hands in such a situation is arguably relatable. However, Every morally questionable decision we make has its own unique ramifications that extend far beyond us, since we're just one part of a much larger system, a much larger and distributed organism of sorts. In the words of Johnny Depp in the first Freddy Krueger movie, it can indeed sometimes feel like morality sucks, but we later see how the parents are depicted as feeling guilty throughout the movies, years after the event. In their own way, they're being haunted by their past actions, which they actively try to hide, bury, and deny to their children. It is interesting that it is the children or the descendants of the parents that are most affected by these inherited psychological scars, especially since they don't understand the full context of what they are up against. They only see the shards or the trees. In fact, on the third installment of A Nightmare on Elm Street, Dream Warriors, a doctor describes the teenager's nightmares as psychological scars or byproducts of guilt stemming from moral conflicts. We quickly dismiss this as we are entertained by the supernatural aspect of the movie, but there is psychological truth to it. I wrote part of this analysis before watching the season 2 finale, and I was pleasantly surprised of how Tom, or a hallucination of him, emphasizes the subject of moral choices while speaking with Jade. <laughs> 
You don't make moral choices based on the outcomes you expect. Make them based on whether or not you think they're right. He even makes reference to the trolley problem, which I think was first explored with Sarah in season one. Thing that would let you see Marielle again. Something that would let everyone here go home, even if it was something bad. Would you do it? The trolley problem is a philosophical thought experiment that explores whether we are willing to sacrifice a few people to save a majority of people, which makes us rethink the command Sarah received from the voices she hears as a moral or behavioral test. We also have the rule of the box in the show, which is basically a death sentence and also morally questionable, which is why we might have seen a transition away from enforcing this rule as Boyd becomes more self-aware as an individual. Going back to the intergenerational transmission of trauma, we now know through research that even fears can be genetically inherited or passed down across generations, as well as other types of memories, which partly connects to Jung's concept of the collective unconscious, which we have explored in my other videos. A shared universal repository of symbols, fears, and dreams that all humans are born with, and from which all mythologies spring. Like Yun said, there's really no such thing as being born like an entirely blank slate. There's no tabula rasa in the way we might think. In regards to the theme of the American Civil War we see in the show, there is also an ever-growing body of scientific literature that indicates how the traumatic events of slavery and even the events of ongoing racial discrimination and abuse before and thereafter still have biopsychosocial consequences that affect African American people to this day, in sometimes hidden and unconscious ways that may not be immediately evident. Our ancestors' past, as well as their nightmares, come with us like invisible chains that pull our strings. The unconscious puppeteer. We are not entirely free in the way we think we are, and we can't begin to break those chains or stop that melody that chains us to the past unless we shine a light on our past and make those chains visible. As we approach the season two finale, we may encounter some turbulence. Please ensure your seatbelts are securely fastened and remain seated until the captain has turned off the seatbelt sign. Thank you for your cooperation and thank you for flying with Frumland Airlines. Now you can remain buckled up as we dive into the highlights of the season two finale of From. We first start where season two, episode nine left us with everyone in a state of panic as Randall, Julie, and Marielle seem to be trapped into a nightmare trance. It is interesting we see Jade expressing concern for Julie, tying back to some of the character traits we discussed about him earlier and the trajectory of personal development he seems to be on. The words he uses, that she should be picking up prom dress and not laying on a bed the way she is, also echo the lyrics of the series theme song. Sera sera, which express how life is uncertain and how things sometimes don't turn out the way we expect or want. In season one, episode six, we also saw Boyd expressing how he never expected to be a military man, how he thought he'd have a future in baseball and be the next Willie McCovey, but life had other plans. Uh, you know, I've had other plans. This theme of the unpredictability or apparent chaos of life is emphasized strongly on season two of From. But at the same time, this season also highlights how these unpredicted outcomes we have in our lives, good and bad, may be part of a larger purpose, a spider web of connections we can't see. For example, if Boy hadn't been in the military and had become the man he is now, he may not be as well equipped to be the hero or leader that the people of the town need to get through their current circumstances. Similarly, they may all need to go through these tribulations as part of a much bigger purpose, like Henny said on this season two finale. Before jumping to the next part, let's answer a question that has been in our heads for a while, at least in mine. Does time run the same for the people in the town as in the outside world? The short answer is yes. The evidence for this can be found in season one, episode two, where Donna explains how she ended up being trapped in the town with her sister when they were coming back from a hunting trip. Donna explains that her sister was skinned alive by the monsters on the same night. Based on the missing poster shared by Epix, now MGM+, Plus, we know that Donna and her sister went missing on August 3rd, 2018. And we are led to believe that the present time in season one, episode two, was February 20, 2022, the date on the missing poster for the Matthews. 
If we subtract those dates, we get 3 years, 6 months and 17 days of difference between them. On the same episode we are discussing, Donna then indirectly confirms that time runs the same when she says that in her mind she still can hear her sister screaming, even though she had died 3 years, 6 months and 17 days ago from that point, which lines up perfectly with the difference in dates that the Matthews and Donna went missing based on those missing posters. This was also verified by Marielle on season 2, episode 2, who said that it had been 6 months since she last saw Christy. It's been 6 months, you never called. And since we now know that the present time in the show is February of 2022, and that Christy went missing on August 6 of 2021, a 6 month difference, we can confirm again that the passage of time in the real world and inside the town are the same. However, there are some phenomena, hallucinations or otherwise, that suggest people in the town may be able to access memories or physically travel to other time periods, as seen with Jade and the Civil War soldier and Boyd in the medieval dungeon where he met Martin. Now, moving along with the finale, we see Sarah helping Boyd and Kenny find the music box to stop the melody, like the nursery rhyme says, by using her psychic abilities. We can see she's able to find it and points at the same location of the dungeon where Boyd found it when he met Martin. It's interesting how once again we see Sarah bleed through her nose, which is not an uncommon element found in movies and TV shows when it comes to using psychic powers. Even though today the first thing we probably think of is Eleven from Stranger Things bleeding through her nose every time she uses her abilities. In that same vein, we see Sarah passing along messages to Boyd and Kenny from what we can infer is the entity responsible for the cicadas and what happened to Paula, Julie, Randall and Marielle, which I feel pointed once again at the likely Freddy Krueger influence on this part of the show. Sarah said that the entity was laughing at them and while looking at Kenny, she said that the entity felt excited when he touched Kenny's arm, which could refer to the time the cicada jumped on Kenny's arm when he was dreaming. Sarah also told Boyd that the entity was glad that Boyd brought it back to the town and set it free, and that he wants to hurt them and make them suffer. As I explained previously, I think that these elements make sense as a metaphor for trauma. Since trauma touches people, is almost contagious, it breaks them, makes them suffer, and steals significant aspects of their lives. Some might say that trauma steals their lives. In fact, the act of bringing this entity from the forest to the town setting it free, given the concepts we've been exploring throughout these videos, parallels the act of bringing a repressed trauma from the unconscious to the surface. Going back to the search of the music box, we now have two themes here. Boyd now knows where the music box is, thanks to Sarah, but it seems like he may not know when the music box is or how he could access it again. The fact that the music box appears to be in the same location but a different time period and that Sarah can hear the melody in real time via her abilities may finally help us get a strong clue as to what the poem on the diner means. Forever is composed of nows by Emily Dickinson. In a previous video, I explained how I thought the poem alluded to the scientific notion that time is just like an infinite landscape with all moments occurring simultaneously but on different coordinates like a map. For example, the you from 10 years ago may still exist in that moment those events are still happening, but our brains only allow us to experience time linearly. This idea was beautifully explored in the movie Interstellar, for those who might have watched it. What's fascinating is that these ideas lend the theme of the show, which says the future is not ours to see, to a different interpretation, suggesting that future events have equally already occurred, or are occurring, but we can only experience the process of getting there. Therefore, que sera, sera, what will be, will be. It is a rather deterministic and potentially depressing perspective, unless the writers explore the idea that maybe there is a mutual interconnection between all these moments of time that allow us to change things to some degree. It doesn't mean anything, but if I could go back and, and change what happened, I, I would. Stop. A more hopeful idea that I think is partly explored in the new Into the Spider-Verse movie. This might have also been hinted by the creators when they said that the story in the show is like a jigsaw puzzle. We don't know if we're at the beginning, middle or end of the story. 
and we see how they provocatively named the season 2 finale Once Upon a Time, likely to tease us about it. Coming back to Boyd, we see that after feeling hopeless about the situation, he goes to Fatima's and Ellis's wedding, and as he hears Ellis's speech, he gets the intuitive idea of using the torch he took when escaping the dungeon as a means to access it again, which I thought was extremely clever and eerily intuitive. If the writers go through the science fiction route to explain some of these mysteries, Boyd's idea could open interesting sci-fi explanations, given that the torch is part of the time period or space where the music is playing. On the other hand, we have the symbolism of fire representing destruction, the cycle of life, and time, themes that have been key throughout this season, especially after Christie's explanation of the term ball of magic fire. Since we can highlight that since ancient times, we have used the sun as a way to track time. It then makes sense for the torch to allow Boyd to walk across time or realms from the symbolic perspective. After Boyd lights the torch inside the ruins of the dungeon, he's transported to the right timeline, and we see Julie, Randall, and Marielle chained to the walls, like Martin was, but with their eyeballs turned white and they seem to be in a lot of pain. Before Boyd destroys the music box with the torch, we see a manifestation that presents itself as Abby and tries to dissuade Boyd from stopping the melody, arguing that they will die and suffer eventually, so it makes no sense to delay the inevitable. I had said in a previous video that the music box, the melody, and the ballerina dance was meant to represent the Dance of Death motif, also known as Dance Macabre, and I think this scene provides stronger evidence for my previous observation. At the same time, this scene also explores morality, given that Boyd essentially has their lives in his hands, and morality is heavily explored this season. While in the dungeon, what looks like Abby then tells Boyd that it is not fear that fits the forest, but hope, because hope makes you more willing to suffer, which is arguably highly deceptive and flawed reasoning, suggesting that whatever took the face of Abby was trying to trick Boyd. And in line with the trauma interpretation, trauma can sometimes make us feel as though trying to overcome it is futile, which in a way parallels the imagery Sarah used of the girl that keeps trying to put the shards of glass back together even though they make her bleed. But the process of mending and healing can cause a lot of suffering, and at times seem hopeless. We then see Boyd destroying the music box with a torch and freeing Randall, Julie, and Marielle from their trance. We should pay attention to how the music box catches fire, and we can see how its inner workings, the cogs and wheels, are revealed upon being destroyed. Keep that image in your mind as we move through this analysis. Finally, as Boyd exits the dungeon, you can hear him scream, YOU DON'T Break me! Which I think is extremely powerful as it connects and negates the part of the nursery rhyme that says they break. And also the themes of trauma and breaking down we've highlighted already, like Sarah's story of the girl and the broken glass. This language of broken themes is used throughout the show, even when Tabitha described that something in her just broke after her baby died. So when Thomas died, something inside of me broke. Another scene from this finale that we should highlight is the revelation that Boyd's hand wound doesn't seem to be closing. We have previously explored the biblical symbolism that the creators have imbued into the show, especially that of sacrifice and suffering, and the crucifixion. Within that context, Boyd's open hand wound is that of a martyr, and the writers don't leave much up to interpretation, given that soon after we hear Donna asking Boyd to stop being a martyr. I'm not giving up. Why don't you just stop being a martyr and come and watch your son get married. Additionally, within the context of psychological scars we've discussed in this video, that open wound might also symbolize Boyd's own guilt and internal moral conflict, especially for having to shoot his wife, Abby, to save someone else he loves, Ellis. Not only that, Boyd's neglect or rather denial of his wife's fragile mental state partly came from his overwhelming drive to save or help the people of the town the night he found the talismans. Between these lines, we see the idea that you have to give something up, sacrifice something to gain something. The higher the reward, the bigger the sacrifice. We can also note the symbolism of the location of Boyd's wound on the left hand, which is popularly highlighted as being mapped with the emotional processing of the right hemisphere of the brain, even though this is really an oversimplification. This is also the hand where Boyd wears his wedding band. Little details that further add nuance to how the wound can represent Boyd's overall emotional trauma, and especially the trauma of having killed his own wife. 
Season 2 of From also focuses on another type of trauma that we don't get to hear about often, and that is betrayal trauma, which occurs when someone we really trust or depend on violates our trust in a significant way, such as when Sarah tried to kill Ethan and how she is responsible for the death of Kenny's father. This trauma extends to Boyd's withholding of this information from Kenny and Tian Chan, who both see Boyd as a father figure and protector. To a lesser level of severity, we also see these dynamics in some of the town residents losing faith in Boyd, with Reggie even shooting him as he believes Boyd is responsible for the death of Paula. A super interesting fact is that the people who experience betrayal trauma are more likely to dissociate than those who experience other types of trauma, which highlights the socially interconnected nature of our identities or personal stories. Dissociation occurs when people feel disconnected from their surroundings or reality. A very minor and relatable form of dissociation takes place when you're riding a train or bus and you just space out for a while losing track of time. However, in response to trauma, people tend to dissociate in more severe and longer term ways, like daydreaming and fantasy, emotional detachment or bluntness, and sometimes emotionally regressing or behaving like a child or a previous version of themselves. This is a coping mechanism that the mind uses to protect itself in response to significant stress. Everybody responds differently to stress and trauma and copes in their own way, like Jean said about Ethan in season two. With that in mind, we should pay close attention to the way Ethan copes with the incredible trauma he's been exposed to as a child, for better or worse. Like I suggested in my previous video, Ethan now appears to be confronting his traumatic experiences without the aid of his stories and fantasy. Hence, his darker shift in mood, which is rather appropriate given the circumstances and his age. And this can also explain why Victor has such a hard time remembering his past and behaves like a child, which can fall under the category of dissociative amnesia. Moving on, in the season 2 finale, we finally learn what the symbol represents. The crossing of three particular branches or tree roots. I have to say though, that from that perspective, those three roots or branches closely resemble spider legs, which I feel is symbolically tied to the theme of destiny and interconnectedness of a system the writers have been hinting at. Especially on this season 2 finale, with the allusion that our lives, just like woven threads, are interconnected in ways we barely understand. Call it the Spider-Verse if you like. Regardless of the mythology that may be driving this narrative, since the mythology of this show appears custom-made, and modifications throughout the seasons are bound to happen. This element also adds symbolic meaning to Elgin's mention of crocheting or weaving threads together. Even his mention that his grandmother always crochets the same thing over and over it speaks of how we humans are bound or hardwired to repeat some patterns of behavior almost instinctively, like a loop. If you watched the show Westworld, you saw that these concepts were explored there, and these are actually in line with our current understanding of cognitive behavioral psychology and neuroscience. Everything is a system, like Jade said, and there are interdependencies among all the system parts, among all of us, that we barely comprehend, bringing us back to Christie's explanation of the term ball of magic fire. We should also note that the cave drawings and the crossing branches that resemble spider legs on the ceiling may parallel the dream Ethan had back in season one, episode two, where he saw drawings on a wall that illustrated everyone in the Lake of Tears. He also said that someone screamed because the spider came down from the ceiling. And I wonder if that might have been a reference to the structure Jay saw on the ceiling of the cave. And let's not forget the seven ghost children laying over stones in a circle right below the ceiling structure. Without veering into an infinite rabbit hole of possible symbolism in the mythology, I think the relevant interpretation here is tied to the question Tabitha was asking in season one. Where does the electricity come from, along with everything else? Last year, I pointed out that the town looks like a literal scrapbook, as if made of hand-picked memories or collector's items. And we've identified the prevalent pattern that where Ever these people are seems like a psychic landscape or a place fueled by psychic energy, dreams or contents. But these ideas were more explicitly communicated by the own characters of the show in season two. Additionally, if the show's creators are truly invested in the dream world idea, which they seem to be, it'd be fair to say that dreams and nightmares need people to dream them and what would be a more powerful source of dreams than a child's mind. With all that said, these children might just be psychic batteries of sorts that keep everything together, 
This will even be in line with the Freddy Krueger influence we discussed about this part of the show. Noting that in the movies, Krueger was powered by the souls or fears and suffering of the children and teenagers he took. But this is just my personal speculation based on the patterns and context we have reasonably established about the show so far. I should also highlight that the imagery of the tree roots wrapping around some areas of the cave is fascinating. Given Tom's metaphor of the town or landscape as an organism with body organs, we can extend that metaphor to view these tree roots as the potential circulatory system of such an organism. Moving on to Tavitha and Victor, we see the bottle tree once again and discover that it was actually a faraway tree. Victor explained to Tabitha that this tree is special because it can teleport people to the lighthouse. We know that Tabitha believes she has to save the children trapped in the lighthouse so that everyone can be free. And we know that Victor's mother attempted to do the same, but according to him, she died before she could make it into the tree and that he found her dead body outside of it the next day. As for the bottles hanging from the trees, my suspicion is that their symbolism might not be necessarily tied, at least not entirely, to the African or American South folk tradition of hanging bottles from a tree to ward off evil spirits. Just like everything else in the show doesn't seem to have an exclusive one-to-one -one association with an existing myth or folktale. The fact that the bottles have dates in them may rather be tied to the lyrics of Gene Crouch's song that was featured in the show, which talks about trapping time in a bottle to relieve a memory forever. Last year, I suggested that these bottles may capture specific timelines or moments of suffering or pain, a subject that was heavily explored in the season two finale. Additionally, with the themes of the American Civil War, slavery, and not being free, which extend to the psychological interpretations of trauma being discussed in this video, the bottles serve as a nice symbolic touch to act as a filter for these nightmares that live in this landscape, to prevent them from escaping, just like a dream catcher or spider web. But this is likely all meant to be symbolic and not necessarily tied to a given mechanic of how this tree works. Moving on, we see Tabitha being teleported to the lighthouse. Remember how I told you to keep the imagery of the broken music box in your mind? You will see why now. As Tavitha makes her way up the spiral staircase, we can hear some of the ghost children chanting the mysterious word, Ankui. We see that the lighthouse happens to be mechanized to some extent, using a gear clockwork mechanism, which in a way parallels the internal clockwork mechanisms of the music box, as explained in my previous video. However, the key part here is that despite its mechanization, the lighthouse appears to use a candlelight instead of a light bulb. For symbolic purposes, this is relevant because it then makes the lighthouse parallel void storage, which allowed him to walk through time or realms. A lighthouse is essentially a giant torch in a way, so it makes sense for the lighthouse to equally then allow passage in and out of the place where the characters of the show are trapped in. Also, pay attention how Tabitha looks around the top of the lighthouse. She can now better appreciate the true stent of the forest, the bigger picture, which ties to the title of episode 8 of season 2, Forest for the Trees. In the lighthouse, we see the boy in white appear in front of Tabitha and apologize to her before pushing her off the top of the lighthouse telling her that that is the only way, which could mean a lot of things and one of them being that that was the only way out. Once again, given that we don't know the full context or purpose of the boy in white's actions, we can't draw any fair assumptions on what he meant. However, it is interesting to know that Tabitha's baby also died by falling off a changing table. And that was the first thing that popped in my mind when I saw this scene, which I think is symbolic of her guilt in that sense, that she is now being pushed off a building in a way by a child. Additionally, falling down as a way out also aligns with the dream world or simulation idea this season has hinted at, and even Abby's words about how dying is the way out. Falling down is a rather common way to wake up from a nightmare. Tabitha then wakes up at a hospital named St. Anthony's, which happens to be the patron saint of lost things and people, but he's also considered the patron saint of children. Once again, connecting to my observation of Tabitha's baby dying from a fall, the boy in white, and my psychological interpretation of the show as an allegory for rescuing our inner children, psychological healing and growth from undeniably revolves around childhood. Now going back, a doctor then informs Tabitha that she was found unconscious three days ago at the edge of the forest by a pair of hikers. Given my previous explanation of how time on the outside world and inside the show seem to align and assuming that she's in the outside world now, then that means that three days should have also passed for the people in the town. However, we can't even be sure that she made it to the real world or whether this is just an extension of the dream landscape she was in. Quite frankly, everything is possible at this point and that's what makes this show so fascinating on that end. 
However, somebody suggested that Tabitha might be in Camden, Maine. And I learned this from a community post my friend Nocturnal Critic shared. So I don't know who to give credit for this, but if you're you, please leave a comment. The view from the hospital window does happen to closely match that of Cannon, Maine, with the structure there likely being Chestnut Church. If you look at this aerial footage by marine photographer Andrew Sims, the link to his channel is in the description, you can see that the topographical parallels are almost one to one. And it seems like Tabitha might be somewhere around this area, with a view towards the church. However, I couldn't find a hospital there, so I suspect that if this is indeed the right location, the view we saw in the episode might have just been a green screen. But we have a problem here. If we are to believe that the date for the characters is somewhere around late February of 2022, like I verified previously, and beginning of March at most, the season for Camden, Maine should be winter. But all these trees look green. And upon further research, it doesn't appear that most of these trees are evergreen trees, at least not the ones around the church. So maybe what we are seeing here is not what it seems. Either the lighthouse displays Tabitha not only in space, but also in time, or she's still within the overall landscape that the town is part of. There are too many possibilities. Now, I would like to hear your theories about this. Could this just be another level or previously unseen part of the landscape they were on? This also reminds me of the episode title of the season one finale, All the Places Will Go. And we will surely go deeper into this analysis of the series very soon. Attention all passengers, as we touch down at the season two finale milestone in our video analysis, we have a delightful surprise for all our viewers. Each one of you has earned a golden ticket, granting you exclusive access to the upcoming part two of our in-depth video analysis. Keep your eyes open for this special treat, as we can't wait to share the next installment with all of you. You can now walk freely around the cabin. Thank you once again for flying with Fromland Airlines.